Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's event with the Taxpayers Alliance. My name is John O'Connell and I'm the Chief Executive of the Taxpayers Alliance. And this afternoon, we're going to be in conversation with John Penrose, MP. I'm going to you know, um, apologise in advance for my quite boring background. I don't have any um, books behind me today to show off my wisdom, but I have read a report recently, a very good one at that, and it was written by John Penrose, MP. And it was called Power to the People. And it's going to be the, the launch pad for our discussion today, um, which we're going to call Power to the People. What should state aid and regulations look like after Brexit? So we're going to be talking about that and a few other things besides. Um, John, thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. He is the MP for Western Supermare and has been for 2005. He's been a tireless campaigner in the areas that we will cover today and others besides that, and usually with a focus on empowering customers over politicians and bureaucrats, which is, of course, something that we can get behind here at the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, he's currently the PM's uh, anti-corruption champion. He's chair of the Conservative Policy Forum and sits on the party's policy board. Um, so he's a busy man. And in September 2020, he was even busier when he was asked by the government to write a report on how to improve the UK's approach to uh, competition and consumer issues, um, particularly in light of the pandemic and, and the coming end of the Brexit transition period. Um, and the report was published last month, of course, and he tackled some big questions in that report, including how competition could work with the levelling up agenda, um, improving consumer trust, embracing technology to uh, your consumer power and much more besides. So, John, given all of that, um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, John. Always glad to, to um, be you know, involved in discussions with Taxpayers Alliance. Um, you, you, I think we're on uh, similar wavelengths on an awful lot of this point about trying to put customers first, taxpayers first. Um, so uh, pleasure to be here, absolutely, certainly. And just on, the, on your background, incidentally, before I start, um, I, I came across, um, and other people will know about this already, apparently you can get um, uh, preset pre backgrounds, and one of them is the Bridge of the Millennium Falcon. Um, which I think is absolutely marvellous, and I'm determined to try and find it. But you can always use that if you are ashamed of your bookcases, I guess. That, well, that's exactly what I should have done to, you know, jazz up this sort of boring cream background behind me. So apologies in advance for that to everyone. Um, but look, listen, um, before we get going, John, um, for the in conversation, just a couple of house rules, one of which is to um, the, the audience. If you do want to submit questions later on, we'll be um, throwing those John's way. So do submit them in the Q&A function. Um, one other house rule is please subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and also um, share that link with friends and ask them to do the same. So, John, um, let's get going. Um, just to set some context about the report that you um, undertook and, and wrote and published very recently, um, how bad or indeed good is our current competition regime, um, you know, especially compared to um, our international competitors and friends? Um, so when you, when you undertook this exercise, were you thinking, uh, I want to rip the whole thing up? Or were you thinking, we're not bad, but just a few tweaks? Really, really important starting point, because, you know, the, uh, as you said, the, the context when I was asked to do this by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, and the Secretary of State for Bayes, then Alak, Alok Sharma, and now Kwasi Kwarteng, was that, you know, here we are, um, at the time we were, you know, the pandemic was fairly new, and we were partway through the transition period for Brexit. We weren't fully out of, of, of the EU at the time. And the important thing is that there's all this sort of supply side microeconomic reform, all these opportunities for us to be more dynamic, faster moving, more digital, just generally more modern in future. As we, you know, as we have now left, completed our exit from the EU in particular, and as we come out of the pandemic. Um, and are, are we set up for it right? You know, are, are we properly prepared for it? And I think the answer is, in sort of footballing terms, we're kind of middle of the Premier League, but we're not one of the one, one of the companies, one of the one of the uh, uh, clubs that's that's challenging for a place in Europe. I can put it that way. So if you look at most of the international um, rankings, we're we're pretty good, yeah. Um, but there's there's sort of three to six other countries or sets of competition rules and and, and jurisdictions which often come ahead of us, the US, the EU, um, France, Germany, Australia, places like that um, are half a notch ahead of us. We're not bad, but they're half a notch ahead of us in, in a lot of people's minds. Um, and the, 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 the sad thing about that is that actually, you know, here in the UK, we kind of pioneered an awful lot of some of this stuff about, about creating 
politically independent institutions that let competition happen in a way which is sort of at arm's length from politicians so that businessmen and women can focus on their customers and what their customers want rather than having to spend all their time worrying about their lawyers or lobbying their lawmakers, um, which is what you end up with if you have a, um, a sort of politicized business environment instead. And we don't want to, re to reward people on the basis of who's got the best lobbyists. We want to reward people on the basis of who's got the best idea and who's got the best product and who's got the best service. Yeah, um, that all sounds extremely sensible. Um, and given that we're a mid-table mid um, country at the minute. Um, what kind of issues do you explore in your report that can get us shooting up to sort of the Champions League spots or maybe even well, the Premier League winners? Th there's a there's a couple of things. I mean, as I said, there's an awful lot of baby that you don't want to throw out with the bathwater. There's, there's a lot of stuff we do pretty well, so you need, we need to make sure we don't mess that up. But there are a couple of things that we really could and should improve. And um, one of them is just you know, the, the the core um, um, competition institutions, the Competition and Markets Authority. Authority and the Competition Appeals Tribunal, which is where you go if you don't like what the CMA says, you, you appeal them to the CAT. Um, they are good, but um, you know, business and the economy is all digitizing. Everything's moving faster today than it was last year, and it's certainly moving faster last year than it was five years before that. Um, and yet, most of our competition rules are written in a pre digital era. Our last competition act was in 1998, so it predates Google, it predates Facebook, it predates Amazon, it predates the World Wide Web, for goodness sake, and most of most of email. Um, so you know, we're, we're kind of running an analog system in a digital world. And one of the things that means is that I've kind of lost count of the number of businesses who've come to me saying, look, you know, um, we don't mind having sensible, you know, competition regulators, but we just wish they'd get to the answer faster. Um, and the, the, the central thrust of this is we've got to make sure that the, that the competition decisions that get taken to try and do a trust busting case over here to get rid of a monopoly over there, to back up a consumer complaint over here, all of that needs to happen really in weeks or months, um, and only a the tiny minority of really complicated um, cases um, should take years. And everything else needs to happen much, much faster because the economy is moving much, much faster. So speed without losing um, quality is step one. A couple of other things I'll come on to in a minute, but does that sort of give you a starting point? Yeah, absolutely. And come on to your next point okay. as well. So, so the, the other bits are, um, we are, there's a really big problem with, um, with the regulatory burden, with the, with the costs of red tape, if you like. Um, now, we need to be careful here because, um, what I'm, what I'm not talking about is trashing our standards. I'm not talking about you know ab abolishing environmental protection standards or workers' rights or food standards. You know all of those things. You want to make sure that what we put in our mouths when we eat a, when we eat a meal tomorrow is just as safe tomorrow as it was yesterday. So we're, we're not changing or talking about changing any of the standards that we expect in modern life. But what we are talking about is saying how can you deliver those standards in a way which is cheaper faster, quicker, more digital, and just generally less bureaucratic. The how, not the what, of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and actually, do you know what? We can go an awfully long way there because the difficulty is that most of Westminster, most of Whitehall, um, most of any regulator, the way you, you, you create a career in all those worlds um, is you make new rules. That's what Whitehall does, that's what Westminster does, that's what regulators do, that's how you advance, that's how you rise up the, the, the regulatory ladder, if you like. Um, and so the whole system is set up to add new rules, not to get rid of them. Um, and so what we need to do is to create a really robust system that says, we don't want to change the standards which we're delivering, but we do want to change and reduce the costs of how we deliver them. And there's a whole series of things we can do there. And that applies not just to the Competition Markets Authority and what they do, it also applies to regulators like Off Watts and Off Com and Off Gem, all, all the Off This Is and Off That's, the economic regulators, they have huge powers. Um, and it applies to an awful lot of the other regulators as well, people like the Environment Agency, many of whom are applying rules which were born in Brussels over the last 40 years when we were members of the EU, um, and which we've never had a chance to apply any you know, cost-cutting regulatory, better regulatory discipline to, in order to work out if we can do them better and faster and cheaper and more digitally. And, and now we can, because now they aren't 
Brussels regulations, they are, they've all now been put into UK law, their UK domestic law, we haven't got an excuse anymore. Um, yeah, we, we, it's, it's up to us to do this, and if we don't do it, we've only got ourselves to blame. So there's a huge opportunity there to get to the same standards with much less cost, and that will just make our economy quicker, it'll make it more productive, it'll make it lower cost, it'll um, reduce the cost of living for you and me and everybody else on this call if we can do it. Um, and you know, I've, again, I've lost count of the number of business men and women, everybody from farmers on through to fintech and high-tech companies, um, who are all saying that we are just so fed up with having to fill in forms and all these sorts of things, can't we, you know, in a digital world, why can't we do this faster? And there are examples where we are doing it faster or we've got plans to do it faster. Um, you know, tax, tax is, is going digital um, about time too. Um, there's been quite a lot of concern about it, but most people say that you know, when they've got through that, it is actually quicker to do it now than it was before when, you, when, when they're using the digital apps. Um, and also, you know, if you look at things like uh, government procurement, for example, the, um, the OGU rules, which are the things that govern how we do things, which we've inherited from the, from the EU at the moment, those do some really important standards in terms of making sure things are transparent um, and making sure that they are competitive. Um, but they're slow and they're clunky and, uh, you know, that we, and we don't do them well in this country. Um, and there's a really big opportunity to make them bigger, faster, better, more digital, much more transparent. Um, and that throws the, you know, all the government tra contracting opportunities open to small and medium sized companies that currently feel frozen out um, and gives us as taxpayers better value for money for, you know, for important public services as well. So lots of opportunities um, there in particular. I've got one more if, you, if, you, if you've got time, unless you want to sort of... Of course. Of, no, 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 no. Go for it, John. Um, the, the other bit is I, I was talking about just now about, um, about the economic regulators, the, the off this and off that, um, off com, off what, off, off gem, all these people. Um, and they've got some really good people working in them, really clever, committed people. Um, but what I think we ought to be doing with them is saying, look, um, you need to be subs, uh, you know, um, subject to this better regulatory um, discipline that I've just described. They weren't in the past. They were always exempt. And there's no good reason why they should be in future. So we can we can get them to do what they do with much less red tape in future. Um, but I think what we can also do is to say, look, they were originally created way back when, in some cases 40 years ago now, when their industries were privatized, because at the heart of each of those industries, there's a network monopoly. Um, so it can be it can be the electricity um, transmission wires, it can be the sewage pipes, um, it can be the gas pipes, whatever it is. There's a network monopoly at the heart of each of those. And the thing you know, any economist will tell you, the thing about network monopolies is they are inherently less competitive and they're harder to make and to become competitive than ordinary markets. So you'll never get them to be quite as competitive as cars or coffee or cornflakes or something like that. Um, but, and it's a really important but, since those economic regulators were created, in some cases 40 years ago, those markets have changed. There's an awful lot more to them than those network monopolies. If you look at, for example, telecoms, you know, the, the network monopoly at the heart of telecoms is the open reach. Um, last, you know, the, the, the old BT um, um, network, which, which goes to most people's homes. Um, and there's a couple of competing networks now being installed by some of their rivals as well. Um, but all the rest of the telecoms market, perhaps is a little bit about, um, about uh, mobile connections, connection networks as well, but all the rest of the telecoms and media markets, most of that isn't a network monopoly at all. Technology has changed, the way we all do things are changing. When, when, when Ofcom was created and British Telecom was, was, was privatised, no one had heard of the internet, certainly not email or anything like that. And certainly no one had dreamed that you could you could stream Netflix and play World of Warcraft and all these other things, which we now take as normal. Um, and so a large chunk of the sector, of the industry, which Ofcom regulates, actually isn't a network monopoly at all. And look, equally large chunks, it could become a normally competitive market if it's given the chance. And actually, to be fair, the good folk at Ofcom and at some of the other sector regulators too, they, they get this, they understand it, they've already started down this route in many cases. So. What I'm saying is, look, we need to finish that journey. Um, and some places we've got a long way to go, and some places we've only got a little way to go, and some places the opportunity is really big, and in some places the opportunity is quite small. But we've got to finish the journey. So um, over the course of the next 
one to five to even 10 years if necessary, I want the, I want the, the sector regulators to publish a plan to normality, to get as much of their sectors, as much of their industries that isn't a network monopoly um, as they possibly can to become a normally competitive market like cars or coffee or cornflakes, as I just mentioned. Um, and they to publish the plan so they can so we can all see how long it's going to take to get that bit of the market to become normal and then the other bit of the market and then that bit over there. And it'll it'll take a different amount of time in each in each sector. But what it means is that over a course of years, which everyone can plan for, and if you're running a telecoms company or an energy company, you can put it into your plans, you can build it into your budgets, you know where you're going, you've got the certainty you need. Um, over a period of years, um, you and I as consumers, um, we are given the power which we expect over anything else we buy because competition becomes king, the customer becomes king because it's a normally competitive market and we can switch our brand of jam you know, the next time we go to the supermarket in a, you know, in a flick of a finger, why, we'll be able to have that same degree of power and control over all these other bits of, 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 of our lives which we currently have less control over. Um, but also, um, what it means is that there's less opportunity for, for flipping politicians um, and, and, and bureaucrats and, and regulators as well to interfere and intervene because they think they know better. And because if you normalize as much of these markets as you can, you take away the scope for politicians to intervene and to try and meddle and to fiddle. Um, and I think that was brought into, you know, the risk of that was brought into really sharp relief at the last general election where we had, you know, in the Labour Party's election manifesto, we had a really you know, pretty left wing um, manifesto, which was aiming to renationalize all sorts of things. Um, and that would have created new monopolies, which would have you know, taken away customer choice and customer power. Um, and if we can reduce that political risk, if we can uh, make it so that these are, it's unthinkable that you know, chunks of the telecoms market would be renationalized because it's just silly, because, it, because it's a normal market like car or cars or coffee or cornflakes, um, then it's better for you and me as consumers. It's also better for business. And because if you take away that risk, that political risk of intervention, you take away a risk premium, and it means that investors are more likely to want to invest in the UK because they aren't worried about the political risk. And when they do invest in the UK, they are going to demand lower rates of return because they don't have to worry about that risk either. So it's just really good macroeconomically and microeconomically for our, for our economy, as well as for your and my cost of living um, as customers and as consumers and as citizens too. John, thank you very much. Um, very, very wide range. I, can I just stay on the, the idea of the network monopolies and you mentioned open reach and of course on the railways we have network rail as well. And actually, actually when you look at network rail they are responsible for more of the delays than any of the train operating companies. Um, yet we still have this popular groundswell for renationalizing the railways, even though, as you say, at the last election, lots of the sort of more outlandish nationalization plans in Labour's manifesto were roundly rejected. But of course, um, renationalizing the railway still is hugely popular, even though the nationalized bit is the bit that doesn't work. How does one make um, what you're saying, which very, makes a lot of sense, um, how, do, how do we make that case more popular? Yeah, really important. And, and in fact, railways are a really good example because. Um, at the moment, you know, um, and, and this is this is I'm afraid, John, that this is this is your and my fault. Um, as people on the centre right, we haven't got out there nearly enough, nearly strongly and loudly enough over the course of the last decade or more, um, to explain that there is actually a far better alternative than renationalisation, um, which isn't more flipping franchising. Because franchising, I think, you know, was was good for a while, but it kind of ran its course and and it ended up with real problems and you know, franchises falling over and all sorts of um, nightmares um, in the run-up you know, before we ever got to the pandemic. And what it's up to us on the centre-right um, to do is to explain how we would, you know, what, what's an alternative which isn't renationalisation, which would work for the railways. There is actually a really good example out there already, and um, it isn't very common, but it does happen on our railways already, um, which, is, which is called um, open access rail, which is basically having lots and lots of different train companies provide laying on trains on the same piece of track and we already do that for um, some services you'll find them uh, the, the um, hull trains for example and um, there's competing services 
um, Chiltern Railways has, has done bits and bits and pieces of it, and the entire freight train network has been doing it for years and years and years, and it works really well. Um, if you take that and you sort of you know, um, industrialize it and, and, and take it more generally, it's up to us to explain why that works for customers and why actually if if the if the John Penrose train company train breaks down or has a strike and and I'm left and, and you're left standing on the platform, um, and then the uh, and then the Taxpayers Alliance train company um, train comes along next five minutes later and it's still running. That's great. That's good, and it gives consumers a much more reliable service because it means that if one company uh, ends up with problems, um, is much more resilient and much more likely that they're still going to be able to get on another train fairly soon. And um, even if they, even if the first one doesn't come, but no one's making that case yet, unless you and I do it. No, fair enough. Um, and just to journey back to regulations more specifically, I know you've said in the report that um, rules and regs should really be a tool of last resort. And of course, regulations can be seen as um, a tax in many ways in that it imposes a cost on business. And you specifically talk about um, uh, a one in and two out target. And how important do you think measures like that are in order to drive change? Um, and do they help um, improve the quality of regulation? Yeah, the answer to that is, is really, really important. I mean, it's absolutely central. And just a, a quick a quick sort of um, comment before I sort of get into the substance of that. Yeah. Um, um, we, need to, we need to make a distinction. I, I made a distinction earlier on between standards and maintaining the standards and then uh, talking about the regulations which dictate how we deliver those standards and those regulations about how we deliver those standards you know um, should be up for grabs and, and how can we do them faster and better and cheaper and quicker but the standards themselves shouldn't be the same thing goes there's a chunk of regulation about how we set up a market so it is in favor and biased in favor of consumers rather than in favor of monopolies or in favor of producers or in favor of politicians or bureaucrats so that the customer is king what um, what economists call the the, the um, consumer surplus it's vital that those rules, you can still do them well or badly, but it's absolutely vital that you set up your markets and your customers and your sectors and your entire economy so it's in favor of customers and consumers and voters rather than in favor of producers. That's the way you get low prices um, and that's the way you get a more efficient, productive, and actually at the end of the day, internationally competitive economy, which is the thing that makes all our jobs safe and secure as well. So with that sort of, um, uh, you know, a caveat at the start. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. You, the problem with, as I mentioned earlier, the problem with Westminster and Whitehall and any kind of um, regulation uh, regulator or government um, is that the way you make make your career is by creating new rules, not by getting rid of them. And that that's the entire culture of the organisation. I'm sitting here um, in Parl in my office in Parliament, and you know, most of the problem here um, originates within about three quarters of a mile of where I'm sitting right now. Um, because of that. It's, it's not because people aren't good or clever or well-intentioned, it's just because it's baked into the marrow of the bones of the place, and understandably so. So what are you going to do? Well, there are a couple of things. First, you've got to get rid of the um, of the loopholes. So in the past, we have been quite good at this in the, in, in, uh, on occasions in the past, but in the past we've had loopholes for anything that started in, that was born in Brussels, um, and we now don't have that excuse, as I mentioned earlier. We can we can close all those loopholes and include all the EU originated rules because they're now UK domestic laws, so they're all up for grabs. Um, and secondly, um, you've got to create a sort of gateway condition. So, if uh, John, if you're the minister for paperclips and you've got a brilliant idea about how to, you know, a new rule for paperclips is going to make the whole paperclips market brilliant, um, what you need to do is to say. Whitehall should turn around and you say, John, that's an absolutely marvellous new rule for paperclips. Of course, we'd love to introduce it. However, you've got it's going to impose you know, um, 10 million pounds worth of extra costs on business in doing it. So we need you to go away first before you can get your new rule introduced to Parliament. You've got to go away and find not 10 million pounds, but 20 million pounds of costs to get rid of um, before you can have your new rule. Now, at that point, since you're the minister, you then have a really powerful incentive for the first time ever, and all your officials in Whitehall have a really incentive, powerful incentive for the first time ever too, um, to go away and find things to do to get rid of that burden. And the chances are you may not change what some of the rules do, but you may digitize them so that they can be done in half the time or whatever it might be. Um, and that's what we need. That's the dynamic that is missing at the moment and which is 
you know, so counter countercultural. And it's only by imposing that kind of gateway thing saying, Minister, you can't get your new rule until you have dealt with the better regulation, getting rid of the of the of the uh, of the burden gateway condition. Um, and until then, you may not um, turn up in Parliament and proudly introduce it. Now, what are you going to do? And you know what? They'll all find something. Hmm. No, it's fascinating. I, I, I'd like to think that if I was the minister for paper clips, I would abolish the position immediately. But that's just <laughs> good start. There you go. Um, yeah, well, that's a good start. Um, but uh, point taken. And, and, and I, I suppose another sort of presentational question following on from that is that given that you know, with, with tax changes, you can argue that a tax cut can bring in more revenue and you can show modelling to demonstrate that. But the, the financial benefits of changing rules and regulations are often much harder to pin down. Is that something that we could improve or is it just sort of too nebulous to try and pin down? Because I feel it would really help make the case. Yeah, you're right. And, and the answer is it's, it's difficult, but not impossible. And there are and, and it's rather like in, in health economics, Health economists have come up with these things called quality adjusted life years, which they use to work out you know, whether or not it's worthwhile giving a 40 year old a knee operation or a 60 year old a heart operation. It's a, it's a horrible cold hearted kind of discipline, um, but it is actually a necessary piece of you know, economic you know, to, to weigh up the costs and benefits of, of, of this and that. And the, and the same thing can be done um, for the costs of um, complying with a particular, you know, the burden of a regulation. So you can do that. The important thing though, is to make sure um, that the accountancy is independently audited so that again, John, um, if you are the Minister for Paperclips and you haven't quite abolished your position just yet and you've got this new new rule, um, that you come up and you say, actually, do you know what? This is a brilliant idea and it only is only gonna cost 50p. Um, actually, th then you need to have an independent order to say, yeah, hang on a second, I wasn't born yesterday. Actually, we're talking about 10 million pounds worth of costs here if it's done the right way. So it's got to be, you, you can't mark your own homework, in other words. If it's independently audited and there are you know, um, uh, 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 techniques of, of economics and accountancy to make sure this is done properly, providing it's externally validated so you can't play the system, um, then that works. And we ha again, we, we've got a decent set of uh, organisations in the UK that have done this okay in the past. We just need to make sure they're given the job. No, fair enough. And um, last point on regulations before jumping to another topic, but um, I often feel that naming specific regulations is much harder, that, that cause damage is, is, is much harder than, than people sort of give it credit for. People talk um, in broad terms about red tape, and then when they're pushed on specifics, they can sometimes struggle. Um, is this something that the businesses themselves should speak up more about? What are the regulations that are causing these issues and, 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 and how can they get them out there into sort of more mainstream conversation? So, I mean, it's a really important point. And it's also, it's also um, one of the two or three favorite reposts of the Sir Humphreys in the civil service, which is, oh, we, you know, we, but we asked the business people and they couldn't come up with any examples. So there can't be any. Um, well, no, the business people are pretty upset and they're not inventing it. Um, it's just that they aren't the regulatory experts. They're trying to run their businesses. Why are you expecting them to do your job? Um, the instantly short excursion. Um, the other favorite Sir Humphrey uh, uh, excuse is, oh, well, of course, we, we did an awful lot of better regulation um, in the Cameron government, um, and we've really done it all. Um, you know, all the low hanging fruit have been done. There isn't very much opportunity to, to make any difference anymore. And so really, you, you can't expect too much. Um, to which my response is uh, some combination of do me a favor, mate. Um, and if I lock you in a room with a bunch of business people and particularly farmers or people like that, um, you know, bring your bring your tin helmet and if you try and tell them that line because you'll get pelted with rotten fruit um, very quickly. Yeah, you, you just it just it's a producer oriented um, piece of excuse rather than something which is grounded in reality and, and no business person will have any truck in believing it at all. But we do need to overcome it because it just shows you the, the deep rooted cultural um, you know, obstacles that we've got uh, to overcome. Um, so so yes, that's absolutely right. And that, what that means is that actually, you know, we shouldn't be asking business people to give examples. If they can, that's lovely. Um, and I've given you one about the OG rules for, for public procurement. There's another one, for example, I, I cite in the paper about, net, uh, about um, water companies. You say, look, at the moment under the EU rules that are now UK rules, um, if they have a water quality problem, they are legally required to build a carbon heavy 
um, heavily engineered, lots and lots of concrete in it, um, water purification plant at the mouth of the river or whatever it might be in order to get the gunk and the muck out of the watercourse. When in fact, in many cases, it will be far faster, cheaper, much more environmentally friendly and just generally better um, if they could strike some deals with some farmers and landowners upstream to stop the muck getting into the watercourse in the first place. And if you gave them the chance, that's what they do. But at the moment, they legally have to have really expensive and environmentally carbon heavy um, uh, water, purif water purification plants instead. So a few of them can come up with those answers. But actually, really, they need to focus on their customers. And Whitehall and Westminster shouldn't be asking the business people to do Whitehall and Westminster's job. And the people who can answer the question best about where is the burden and how can you get rid of it are the politicians and the bureaucrats and the regulators. It's us who have the answers. And actually, you know, if, you, if you talk to the people who run some of the, uh, some of the, some of the regulators, um, uh, some of the, particularly some of the economic regulators, and say to them, look, you know, if I told you you had to do one in, two out from now on, they go, yeah, okay, we can do that. You know, we, we can adjust license conditions for our for our uh, for the company we regulate or something. Um, don't tell us how. We'll, we we can work it out. We know where the bodies are buried. Um, but you know, give, give us the target and we'll hit it. And that, and that I think is the is the right way to do it. Don't don't let Whitehall say there's nothing to do because they're the ones who know where where the bodies are buried and where the things are, where the things can be improved. Wow, um, that's good to hear. Actually, uh, the, the regulators themselves can be of um, of, of benefit in this process. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just want to jump to um, a, a separate topic very quickly on levelling up and how your report and the thrust of it um, marries with that broader government agenda of levelling up. Because you mentioned in your report that um, the government really shouldn't use its post Brexit powers to subsidise specific industries or pick winners, and 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 that sense, general sense mm -hmm. they shouldn't pick winners. Um, and given that we know lots of sort of people in quote unquote left behind areas voted leave, do we just rely on the market alone to deliver the leveling up agenda? Um, no, but the market has got a big part to play. It, it, it won't be enough on its own, but it's, it's, it's a necessary, vital part of the mix. Um, but, it won't, but we'll need to do some other things too. If you look at some of the work done by, for example, the Centre for Cities amongst others, and um, what they'll say is that <clears throat> The things that dictate whether or not a particular area has got a thriving economy or not, first and foremost, it's local skills, um, and then it's availability of um, of uh, real estate at a sensible price, whether it's business premises or factory premises or office premises or housing, whatever it might be, and then it's also transport links, whether or not it's um, uh, for, for commuters or for freight or for whatever it would be, and um, all those things matter too. Um, but you're absolutely right; competition's got a really big part to play too, because if you look at what, what the competitive map of the country shows, um, and you look at the productivity map of the country as well, what they both show is that, broadly speaking, London in the southeast of England is internationally competitive on competition, um, on exports, on productivity, compared to pretty much any other country in any other you know, um, uh, industry in the world. Um, the trouble with it is, um, the moment you get outside London and the South East, most of the rest of the UK um, is, on average, below the rest, you know, behind the rest of the developed world, behind the rest of the EU. Um, and actually, our gaps between the best and the worst within our country are much bigger and much starker um, than in many other countries in, in for example, um, Western Europe. So there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and that means that one of the things we've got to do is to try and raise the competitive temperature um, outside London and the southeast. It's already pretty good in London and the southeast. Doubtless could be helpful if we raise it a bit further there. But actually, the place where it's really going to matter, where it's going to pay dividends, is you know, where, where, I, where I live and where I, where I represent, down in the southwest. You know, I, my, my seat is Western Superman near Bristol. Um, you know, the southwest or Merseyside or the northeast around Hull or any of these areas, all of us, if we can raise the, 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 the competitive temperature and pressure, um, then uh, so, so that good companies that do well by their customers win and expand and grow and then you know, become so competitive that they can export successfully too, that's actually going to be you know, one of the fastest things you can do to raise um, you know, the, the, the life chances of people who don't live in London and the South East at the, at the moment 
and also mean that you, you, you may want to move to London and the South East to follow a job opportunity, but there may be more brilliant job opportunities elsewhere around the country too. So really big opportunities there. And there's all sorts of things you can do. I'm, I, I've, I've spoken about um, trying to introduce things called county competition courts. So local, local firms that feel like they're being, if you are a, um, a startup builder, in I don't know Merseyside or Hull or Greater Manchester or whatever, and you think you're being ganged up on by some of your long-established competitors, at the moment there's not much you can do about it because the CMA may may launch an investigation into, into your particular problem, but you may be just too small to move the dial for them. Actually, if you've got a county competition court, you can take these people to court and get a judgment against them, stop them ganging up on you and behaving in an anti-competitive way and breaking the rules. Um, and if you can do that, um, actually that'll be good for you. It'll be good for the people you employ. It will make the local building market or estate agency market or whichever sector you're in much more competitive. And that'll be good for consumers and local residents too. Um, and it'll help us level up. So all of that matters, but it's a question of raising that competitive pressure and temperature um, outside the Southeast in particular. Yes, um, interesting. Um, it's outside the purview of your report, but what do you think of um, decentralizing taxes so that local areas can raise more of their own money to spend locally? Uh, you're right. It, it's um, it, it's beyond the the scope of my report. So this is a sort of a um, a, a personal opinion, which you, you won't find in the in the report itself. But look, um, the a, not, a problem which we have faced for a long time in this country, and this is something which has been um, <clears throat> been an issue for successive governments, in Labour and Conservative, and the coalition too. So it isn't just unique to to today. Um, is that local government? Um, spends central taxpayers' money and only raises a proportion of the tax that it then goes on to spend itself. And, you know, as a taxpayer for all of us, um, that's a very, very dangerous place to put any politician in because it basically means that politicians can therefore always argue for more spending and then they can blame central government for not giving them enough cash to do it. It is far better. You get much better quality of government. doesn't matter if it's a Labour government, a Conservative government, uh, Lib Dem or Green, perish the thought, but you know, any of those, um, you get much better quality of government um, if politicians have to kill what they eat. They have to raise the taxes themselves and take the heat for raising those taxes in order to, but before they can spend the money. Um, and the difficulty you've got at the moment is that um, you know, things like business rates um, are, a, you know, are a dying tax um, or at least an eroding tax because of the online market, uh, um, you know, uh, online trading. Um, and so therefore it's a problem which successive governments have tried to deal with. And I, I think we're making a bit of progress. There's a lot further to go, but fundamentally politicians should raise the taxes that they're then going to spend rather than asking someone else to do the dirty work and then blaming them for not raising enough. Mm, no, no, fascinating stuff. I tend to agree. And I like the kill what they eat line. It's a, <laughs> it's a very good one. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned at the start, and as you've alluded to throughout, your 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 a lot of, a lot of what drives some of your work is 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 consumer trust and 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 consumers trusting that in in the process. Do you believe that a breakdown in that trust has probably helped to sow the seeds of discontent with capitalism more broadly, or do you feel that um, it, it's something that doesn't really bear out because people vote with their wallets anyway? Um, I, well, I think. I think I'd say um, yes to both those, uh, both, both, both those options. I mean, uh, you're right that um, wallets matter in any election, of course. You know, we all care about our standards of living and, and, you know, um, and, and so forth. Um, but um, I think, and, I've, uh, and this is something I've been campaigning on for a while before I was asked to write this report, um, I think that we've got an emerging problem or an emerged problem ever since the 2008 banking crash. And this isn't unique to the UK, incidentally, um, but it's a sort of crisis of the legitimacy of capitalism, of open markets, um, that people feel that, um, that the system's kind of stacked against, too much stacked against the ordinary man or the woman in the street, um, and that are not enough of the, you know, the, the, the benefits of success are flowing to, 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 to everybody, to, to broader society. Um, and so there is a problem of legitimacy, and people get really irate and understandably so if they feel that they can get ripped off it doesn't matter if it's their energy company or their insurance company or whatever it might be if the system if they know the system is on their side so that if they do get ripped off they've got a good um, option for going to an ombudsman or going to a small claims court um, or having somebody who will basically come along and fix the flipping thing for them 
with minimum fuss. If they know that the system works in their favor, which in most cases for most of us, it does still all the time. Um, but if it stops working in their favor or there are high profile examples where it doesn't, then trust gets eroded quite fast. And then people start saying, well, hang on a sec, you know, why am I working hard and paying my taxes and doing all the right things and putting something by for my retirement when so-and-so down the roads, gaming the system, cheating this or that oligarch is swanning around in a Ferrari when actually they stole most of the money um, from, the, you know, from the GDP of, of, of a less developed nation somewhere else on the planet. And now they're here and living the life of Riley. It's not fair. And so it's really essential that the system is set up to be, um, sorry, that's the, that's the bell, it will stop in a second. Um, it's really essential that the system is set up to be on the side of people like you and me, um, and the side of the, of the man and the woman in the street, um, rather than on the side of politicians or, or, or bureaucrats um, or, or, or oligarchs as well. That, that, that's really interesting, John. And just to develop that before I open up for uh, audience Q&A, um, the sort of consumers versus producers argument. I mean, in the state sector itself, do producer interests inhibit reform in areas like education or healthcare? Um, do we focus too much on producer interests and not on the consumer? Um, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the bell's going off in the background. I, I don't have to vote at the moment, so, so I'm, I can carry on with you. But if, if it starts to interfere with the quality of sound, um, chat, you should stop in a second. You, you're, you're pretty loud and clear, so go for it, John. Okay, okay that's fine. I'm going to stop now. Um, so, um, you are right. Um, that's my point earlier on when I was talking about better regulation, saying there is, there's a group of... of I'm flipping it. Sorry, it will stop in a minute, I promise. Um, the, uh, there's a, some rules are the rules that make sure that markets work fairly and they work for the benefit of you and me rather than for the benefit of monopolists um, or, you know, or people with good lobbyists. Those rules are absolutely essential and if they aren't strong enough and they aren't set up the right way, then capitalism falls over. And actually, you know, in the past, what we've seen is that every, every generation or two, you have to update and refresh those rules. So you know, um, back in the start of the 20th century, um, you know, we had to invent an awful lot of antitrust and anti-monopoly rules because there weren't any. And there were huge monopolies being built um, in, in America in particular, um, which had to be dealt with. Um, so, yeah, so modern um, competition rules were born then. Go back another century before that, and you'll find people um, saying, well, actually, you know, banks are going bust and taking down everyone's savings at the same time, so the Bank Charter Act was created. Um, between those two, during the 19th century, there are all sorts of rules about, um, about worker rights and um, worker safety, so that we no longer send children up, 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 up chimneys you know, to, 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 to clean them. Um, and every once in a while, everyone says, hang on a sec, you know, the, the rules are getting out of date. They aren't on our side anymore. We need to refresh them. And our generation's version of that challenge is the rules around digitization. Um, and you know, the, the thing about it is, it, is as I said, the, our existing competition rules, you know, we, they were last updated. Our last competition act in this country was 1998. So it's before Google, it's before Amazon, it's before any of these other things. Um, and since then, there have been some really honkingly huge um, digital monopolies that have been invented and emerged. Now, actually, you know, the digital, the digital marketplace and the, and the digital economy is brilliant. It makes your life and my life and everybody's life immeasurably better than it was even three years ago, let alone ten. Um, so, yeah, there's a huge amount that's really, really great about it, but we just need to watch out because we've, we've got some old problems coming back in new forms, and it's our generation's challenge to work out how we're going to stop them um, you know, um, ripping us off um, or exploiting us um, in new ways so that we don't, you know, we don't create new problems to go with the great stuff that's come along too. John, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move over to audience Q&A now, uh, John, if that's okay. So um, first we've got a question on um, the spending of taxpayers money and the issue of public procurement um specifically defense and obviously ppe um has been in the news and with significant sums of taxpayers cash um, been spent on them and you touch on this in the report but how can we make those processes more transparent and open up the processes to smaller companies yeah really important issue and uh, and you know the, the interesting thing here is that 
Um, I, I mentioned I mentioned before the the European rules, which we've kind of inherited, which do some really important things in, in terms of demanding transparency and demanding um, you know, um, competitive auctions and those sorts of things. But the trouble with it is, at the moment, they are pretty slow. The way we the way we apply them in this country, at least, is pretty slow. It's not very digital. It's quite bureaucratic. Um, and um, and if you talk to small and medium sized companies, they say that um, they feel like they're being shut out of the North Wales market by you know, um, well set up incumbents who understand the system better than they do. Now, the good news there is that there's actually um, there's actually a government green paper that's just been published in the course of the last three months. And if anybody on this on this call is interested in this area, I'd really encourage them to have a look at it, which basically acknowledges this problem, says we've got to fix this. And they're absolutely right. Um, and comes up with a set of proposals to create a system which is much faster, digital by default, transparent by default, much more um, accessible to small and medium-sized challenger companies as well. Um, and the, the central recommendation in this area in my report is that's great, um, but why is it only a green paper? We should do it tomorrow, if not yesterday. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's an answer, there's a solution that's out there that's been worked out, um, that is ready and waiting to go pretty much. Um, I think that we all need to get the government to get on and do it as fast as we can, particularly because, as you mentioned, um, you know, there's quite a lot of um, political criticism at the moment um, because the pandemic has shown up just how slow and clunky our existing system is. Um, and the problem with that is that you know, there's been a whole bunch of, of, uh, of, of contracts which have um, been done on direct award, which is much less competitive. And actually, from the, from the taxpayer's point of view, we all want all of them to be done fast and transparently and quickly. So that's the answer. Let's get it in place as fast as we can. Good stuff. There was a couple of questions that, that were grouped in that same vein with um, opening up the process to SME. So I hope that answered that. Um, another question came in on the case for renationalizing water. Now, I, I do know that this is one that splits the small C conservative center right um, movement in debate a little bit. What do you think of the case for renationalizing water? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm on the let's not renationalize it side, but but not uh, in, in my case, it's a it's kind of a pragmatic um, <clears throat> uh, reason um, as much as a sort of political one. And the pragmatic reason is simply this: um, uh, the amount of investment that's going to be needed in water um, as we go towards net zero. I mean, there's, there's a lot of investment needed in things like energy as well. Um, but water is going to need to be front and centre towards getting us to get to net zero. Um, and yeah, if we have to do all of that um, through a nationalised industry, um, which is dependent on the state of the government finances for the, uh, every year at every budget for the next 40 years, given the lifespan of the, of the, of the um, assets, the life cycle of the assets that we're talking about, It'll just never get done, or it'll get done too slowly. We won't hit net zero, um, but if we keep it in public ownership and we and we regulate it carefully and properly and well and wherever possible, um, with as much competition as we can bring to bear, then we can use private investment. We can reduce the political risk and therefore reduce the cost of that private investment and therefore reduce the costs of water to you and me as consumers. Um, but it means that if we and we can ask them to move faster than the chancellor will ever be able to afford if it has to be done all on the on the on the government's um, balance sheet. Particularly given the fact that the government's balance sheet is now a heck of a lot more borrowed because of the effects of the pandemic, for good reasons, um, than it was a year ago, and therefore the stresses and strains and the constraints on that are even stronger and more difficult than they were a year ago. John, thanks. Um, a final question that again groups together a few uh, a few of the questions. But um, what next? How do you take your report um, and all of the good ideas in it and then put them into action? Um, a really important question because, uh, you know, as you said in your introduction, this was a, a report I was asked to write you know, by the Chancellor, by the Secretary of State for Bayes, so you know, senior cabinet ministers. Um, but it's a report to government rather than a statement to government policy at this stage. So there's a whole series of recommendations. And now, the good news is that um, since it was published, as you say, a couple of weeks ago now, um, it's had a really positive reception. Um, the worst anybody has been is neutral so far. Um, and, but other than that, it's been anywhere between neutral to you know, strongly in favour. Um, and that matters because 
it shows ministers and it shows um, officials that the wind is at their back um, and that the, the ground is rising up to meet them. Um, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to do, to do the, the right thing um, with, with any luck, relatively less fuss. Um, and so the, the, the plea which I would make to the Taxpayers Alliance and to anybody else on this call is, look, um, it's great that ministers now know that you know, the pitch is rolled as flat as it can be um, and that there's, there's a, a, a reasonably warm reception to these ideas and that therefore there shouldn't be any massive obstacles um, to going ahead and, and introducing quite a lot of them. Um, but if we're going to get them done, what it's going to take is pressure. It's going to take expectation. It's going to take um, a rising chorus and a rising um, sound of drumming fingers and tapping feet. Um, and well, where is it then from people like, like the Taxpayers Alliance and the other folk on this call? So everybody here, you know, please, 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 whenever you get a chance, say, when are we going to do this? How can you, know, why, why aren't we doing it yesterday? Um, quite a lot of it doesn't need primary legislation, a few bits of it do, but quite a lot of it can be done tomorrow. And uh, we just need to get you know, ministers who are incredibly busy with you know, pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. We all understand that. But you know, pressure, pressure, pressure um, and democratic uh, uh, expectation um, is the next step in order to turn this from you know, bright, bright, what I hope are bright ideas, well-received ideas at least, um, into action. John, thank you very much. And bang on time as well. Look at that. Um, it, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined today for, for all of your support for the Taxpayers Alliance. And um, it, it's meant a lot to us over the last year, um, in particular, when we've we've been distant from one another. So hopefully in the not it, hopefully soon we'll be able to get together for an event like this with maybe a drink or two just to um, uh, liven events up a bit. But um, thank you to, to, for all of your support. And thank you especially to our guest today, John, for taking the time out to talk to us we really appreciate it and to have thought so deeply about so many different issues because lord knows um, an improved competition policy would be a great thing so thank you john thank you all very much really appreciate it